So this is our fifth year here in Holy Family, and we have seen uh, how St. Joseph has provided so often for our, our many needs, especially, especially in the early years before people knew us and before we were established and before people I don't know, any, any, any iota of what actually happened in here. Uh, it, it was just a wee bit more difficult uh, to get support or, or for people to, to, to maybe be positive towards our mission, whereas now I think we're just that little bit more established. So uh, things are, I suppose, that little bit easier. But St. Joseph has really provided so, so, so often for, for all of our needs. Uh, everything from, from donations to food donations to the students that we have here. Uh, to staff and friends and everyone who has in any way helped uh, what goes on here, it's all fruit of, of providence, it's all providence. The way we know it's providence is it's not because of anything we did. You know, uh, it's different if you kind of set up uh, a committee to raise 100 euro and you raise 100 euro. Okay, that's not exactly providence. Um, it is in a way, but uh, it's more, we were just getting on with, with doing our mission and forming young people and then the Lord provides. It's just it's pure providence, pure providence. So we've, we've seen that so often here. We've been so uh, blessed by uh, all of your generosity and uh, by, of course, the, the intercession and prayers of St. Joseph and all of our saints in heaven. I was thinking one of the young people who's passed through the doors here who has to remain nameless, she had this wonderful expression. Whenever she would do, have to do something that she wouldn't like, like maybe you know cleaning out toilets. I'm not sure if anyone really looks kind of looks forward to that one, but she would just say, well, she would declare. Actually, she wouldn't just say it. She would declare to the nation that she was going to unite it silently to the cross. Okay, I'll just unite it silently. Or when we we would say, look, so we're going to go on a hike. We're going to go up Schlieven on one of the mountains around here. She'd say, hike the whole way up there. Oh, I'm just going to unite it. I'm going to unite it silently to the cross. Now the whole way. This is, here I am, uniting it silently. Uniting it silently to the cross, I, you know, nothing silent about it, but anything, anything she had to do that was a bit difficult or uh, challenging or whatever she didn't like, she would declare to the nation that she was uniting it silently to the cross. And um, while, it was, it, while it, was, it was rather humorous uh, on one hand, on the other hand, uh, there was actually a kind of a deep, she, she did actually mean it, just she was telling everyone, but she did actually mean uh, that she was actually uniting these little inconveniences of the day to the cross, you know? And it's, it was an, it's an interesting thing because when you look at the life of St. Joseph, uh, we can see how he would have done something similar. Obviously, the cross, as we know, it hadn't actually happened yet in St. Joseph's life, life. But offering up suffering, uh, maybe like a lack of surety as regards how the future is going to unfold, what's actually going to happen, that kind of unknown future that you're called to step into. Offering all of this up, that would have been something that St. Joseph did every day. Yesterday we spoke about leadership and we spoke about how, how Jesus formed leaders and how we can learn from that how to be, how to be leaders ourselves or to kind of what to look out for in a good leader. We spoke about how... Uh, he would use these, these three steps, if you will. Win people, win them first, build them, and then send them. So win them, uh, he would win them by, by having a clear goal. So when he's, when he's calling apostles, I mean, uh, did they know what they were being called to? I mean, Jesus was fairly clear about the fact that he wants to establish a kingdom. Not in the sense of a kingdom of bricks and mortar, but something deeper. God's kingdom is here in your hearts. So there was, there was a clear goal. If you're going to win people into any group, association, club, sport, whatever it may be, the goal has to be clear. You have to know what you're part of, what you're, what, what you're about. Same in the church, if we're, not, if we're trying to win people, but we're just winning people in order just to kind of come together and just, just be together and just, just be. I remember I was, I was talking to a, a youth minister years ago and... Uh, she said she was a, a lay chaplain in the school. And I said, all right. I said, what, what, what do you do? I mean, is it, is it kind of counseling or do you take religion classes or what? And she said, well, in my formation, I, I was told that the impo what, what's important for us as, as counselors, in a, as uh, chaplains in a school, is simply that we, that we be. And I, I was waiting, of course, for, for, for the next word, you know, that we be present, that we be loving, that we be, you know, a disciple, that we be. And then I realized there was a big, dirty, full stop there. 
right? And I thought that was the, actually the end of the sentence. And that sentence was actually supposed to mean something, which of course it doesn't, <laughs> right? Because you can just be, which is completely useless, <laughs> right? If, if you're in a school and you're surrounded by, by teenagers, right, they have needs. You just being there doesn't do anything. If you want to be there as a support, be there as, as, as a loving presence, if you want to be there as even a, a prayerful presence, an intercessory presence, whatever. But I think drawing the line or finishing the sentence at just be is stopping way short of the mark. Okay, anyway, I, I digress. We're back. So in order to win people, we have to know what we're winning them to. In order to be uh, uh, involved in our faith, we have to know what the goal is. What's it all for? And what it's all for, of course, is eternal salvation, salvation of our souls, the ultimate goal of everything that we spend eternity with heaven, in heaven with God. So when God is, when the Lord then is winning people, he's winning them for, for this kingdom, okay? And then he also shows them that he cares. So you're not winning people, you're not teaching them in order to feel important. You're not, you know, bequeathing unto the infidels uh, your vast knowledge so that it makes you feel good. But you, you teach them because you want them to know the truth, you want them to live in the truth. You want them to be free. So he would have known, sorry, they would have known, the apostles would have known that Jesus cared. We also mentioned that in order to, to win people, you must be willing to sacrifice yourself. You know, he who bleeds, leads. Just being smart, that doesn't make you a good leader. Having lots of ideas, that doesn't make you a good, a good leader. Being willing to sacrifice yourself for the people you lead, that'll make you a good leader. Anybody can talk. Putting it into practice is a very different thing. So this is what we see in Jesus, right? When he wins people. Then he, he, he builds them. So he, he invests in this small group of, of, of men, wins them, he builds them up. He spends three years with them. They see him preaching and teaching and healing and talking and parables and then the explanation of the parables that only the apostles got and all of this, this, this dynamic. So he builds them up. And another part of, of building up the apostles was that you have to give them a little bit of responsibility, right? Being a leader doesn't mean you do everything. You know, you can't micromanage everything. That, that, that's not good leadership. Uh, you, you have to delegate and entrust little things, well, starting with little things, to, to, to the people that, that, that you're leading. And then as their ability grows, they, they, they receive more and more to do. So what does the Lord do? I mean, he entrusts the church to us. Okay, he sends out the, the, the apostles, sends out the 72 in twos. Okay, he's building them. And finally then, when these people are, are built up, the Lord sends them out. Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus responds, it's not for you to know places or times or these things that are reserved only for the Father. But you will be my witnesses. Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Effectively, Jesus says, you will. When are you going to do it? You will. So, we're sent in Jesus' name. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Teaching them to observe all that I've taught you, all, all that I have commanded. Okay, so we move on to, to how St. Joseph then is formed. So St. Joseph isn't formed by Jesus per se. Uh, St. Joseph is more formed by, by God the Father. It gets a small little bit complicated because it's not, it's not that Jesus as a second person of the Holy Trinity is absent from this formation process, but just to make it a little easier for our small heads. Uh, Jesus, sorry, the Father forms Saint Joseph and he forms him in two ways in sacrifice so amidst these difficulties these, these crosses in his life keeping in mind this beautiful little family is entrusted to you so this, this absolutely so like beauty in the, in, in the most profound sense of the world or the word our lady who is so virtuous I can imagine she was aesthetically pretty as well, but, but it was that, 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 full, that, that being full of grace, that full of, of 
virtue and love and service and the whole she just would have been absolutely amazing company she would have been just lovely just to be with like she'd make you feel feel like a million denarii you know uh, she just she, you, you'd have felt great with her like she's just such a wonderful lady you know and, yeah, and then St. Joseph, like, who I could imagine, like, when he'd have to walk anywhere with her, he'd be a little, she's with me. <laughs> like, it just would have been just, just so nice to be with her, right? Uh, and so he has to, you know, he wants to protect her, as, 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 as any man would. So off we go, census, back to, to Bethlehem. Now, maybe they left a bit late, who knows what. Either way, when they get there, uh, maybe she forgot her handbag or something. Uh, but either way, when they get there... Uh, no place, no place to go, no accommodation sorted, no way of Googling available restaurants. Uh, so imagine like the, 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 the embarrassment, like I want to provide for this lady, I mean, I want to provide for this, this, this uh, miraculous little child and they end up in a stable. And then eight days later he's circumcised, 40 days later they have to nip up to 10 kilometers up to Jerusalem to offer all the various ablutions and that uh, in accordance with the law. More than likely, the three wise men arrived after that then. And then there's, they have to flee, flee to Egypt. Remember, Egypt where Jews wouldn't have been liked. That was where the Red Sea kind of closed in on all of their forefathers. So the Egyptians didn't really like Jews. And here's St. Joseph having to go down there now with his do you know, with this family that you want to protect, you, will, you would protect, he would have protected with his life. But you're, you're not in a friendly place, like, and you don't, do you even speak the language? You know, so you have to try and start making a trade, and, and then he would have been very honest. So would people have taken advantage of his honesty and said, he's not going to fight back anyway. You don't need to pay him. You know, so the cross, the cross was not absent from St. Joseph's life. So this, this, this sacrifice, uniting his sacrifice silently offering it to God that's the second aspect of how Saint Joseph was built up by God in the silence in sacrifice and in silence Saint Joseph wasn't one to just yabber on and, 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 and I mean he, obviously he did talk he did speak right the, the scriptures don't record any of his words but of course he spoke uh, but he wasn't one he wasn't a man who just kind of blah blah and just have to keep talking about how much he knew and how, how, how uh, experienced a carpenter he was. He was a man who would see or know, discern what God wanted and do it. It just seems so simple, you know, at the end of, of our gospel today. She will give birth to a son, you must name him Jesus, because he's the one who is to save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord told him to do. He didn't deliberate about it for, for months. He didn't say, well, maybe yes, maybe no, and we'll see. The Lord speaks through the angel. St. Joseph does. That's it. St. Joseph acts. A man of action. But that can only come from already being united to God. If you're not already, if your heart isn't already his, you, get, you have a dream like that, you will keep second-guessing yourself. Oh, I don't know, we'll see. And ultimately, you won't do anything. But his heart was being formed in suffering. That, and that would continue throughout their life as a holy family. We don't know when he passed away. Uh, it would have been, I think, an amazingly touching scene to see St. Joseph. We, we, we don't know what age he was when he died. Obviously, there are um, private relations in that, about that. But we, we, we don't know... Uh, how old he was, but you can imagine like our lady at his side holding his hand and Jesus there. Uh, and like the profound love both of them had for St. Joseph, just beautiful. This man, this father, whose heart had been formed in suffering and in silence. What an example to us as priests, to us as men, to us as fathers that in silence we offer whatever sacrifices come our way, that we may be formed into fathers after the Father's own heart. And so we ask the good Lord today, through the prayers and intercession of Saint Joseph, 
that fatherhood, the, the, the need for fatherhood, the beauty of fatherhood, the necessity of fatherhood, will be rediscovered. Anything that reminds the world of God as father will be viciously attacked by the enemy. And so fatherhood is very much in the enemy's sights at the moment. So we pray for a renewal of our understanding of fatherhood and that all fathers will rediscover their vocation as men who silently unite their crosses to the cross of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>